um, in this talk today, I just want to kind of enter into that theme of like the theme of the whole entire day today. And I love this theme because it's, uh, it's worded really interestingly, receive the gift you are. I'm like, hmm, normally we just hear you're a gift, but it's like receive the gift you are. I'm like, well, what does that mean? And what does that look like? And how do we do that? And I was thinking about that quote from St. Augustine where he says, God is always trying to give good things to us, but our hands are often too full to receive. Let's just talk about that for a minute. Like, what are our hands too full of that we can't receive the gift that we are? Because if we go back to the beginning, we're like, okay, God made us in his image and likeness. Clearly, it says in scripture what a gift we are as we read this, the story of creation. That it's like the crown of all creation. and We're very good and all of this stuff. So it's like, this is our, our identity at the very core is that we're good, that we're a gift, that God made us out of love, for love. He's love himself, and, and we are made in that image. So everything about us is made as a gift and to be a gift to another. So I was thinking, what are my hands too full of? It's like, hmm, distractions, busyness, uh, lies and false narratives, idols, shoot, you know. <laughs> God impressed this on my heart. I was actually with Father John at a conference a few weeks ago, and um, I had this Sunday talk, and it was like evangelization, go and whatever, and, and the Lord was like, I want you to talk about idols. And I was like, that's not an exciting Sunday, go forth. And, you know, but I was like, but this is what needs to be talked about. And honestly, I was confronted with like a big one in my own life. Like I gave that talk, and I felt like it was like something that was burdening my heart to share, and it just kept burdening me after the talk. Because the Lord was like, Heather, there's an idol in your life, and you know what it is, and I'm putting my finger on it because I love you too much to let it stay. I want to be the one thing. I was like, oh. <laughs> now, when you deal with those things, my hands are full of something, something that is taking up room that the Lord wants to inhabit in my own life. And so I'm coming to you today to share things with you that I'm like right in the middle of myself. And should we not all be in the middle of it at all times, like addressing what are the things that are standing in the way between me and the love of the Father, between me knowing that I'm a gift and being able to share myself as a gift to the whole world. You can't share what you don't have. You know that saying. But if you don't know that you are a gift, you cannot share yourself as a gift with the world, which is, this is what we're made for. We're made to make a gift of ourselves because this is the image that we were made in. God gives himself away. That is the beautiful union of the Trinity, of the Trinity that we are made in the image of. So the idols, ooh, just drop that down. You'll come back to it later <laughs> in prayer time. I was like, what else are my hands full of? Myself, oh shoot. Yeah, I'm in there for sure. Um, noise, bad news. I mean, the list was just like, it was just so quick. It all came. I was like, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of voices. There's, there's my voice. There's the voice of the world. There's the news and doctors. So many medical things. I'm like, what do we believe? You know, and then vaccines and not vaccines. Like so much competing information that we don't know who to trust and we don't know where to go. And you know, there's so many things that I'm like, overall, it's just one big distraction. Because most of it, when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter. Does it matter what this person says, what this person says, what the Pope's doing, what he's not doing, what this guy says is right, what this person says is wrong? Like those things ultimately don't matter. What is God calling me to and how faithful am I being? Am I in the deepest union with God that I possibly can be? Am I pursuing that? And am I looking at the things that are dividing me and God? Am I looking at those? So what are our hands too full of? All the things. You can make your own list. I'm sure it's similar to mine. There might be a few other things in there, um, but it's full of a lot of things. But we have to, like, when we hear these things, we go, yeah, I know, I know, that's good. And it needs to move from the yeah, I know, and yeah, that's good, to actually transforming something within us. Because the division that is between us and God isn't supposed to be there. This is the story. God made us in perfect union. So beautiful, the beginning of the story, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. How awesome would that be, right? Can you picture it, walking in your garden, just having a chit-chat? Like, that would be awesome. Why did they mess that up? You know, like... <laughs> and then I think... 
why do I mess that up? <laughs> you know, go to confession, why did I just mess that up? We experience these moments of restoration of the relationship, and then we go ahead and mess it up. You know, it seems to be a theme, right? So what is going on there? And how do we move from knowing it to having this be the thing that is burning on our hearts? Union with Christ needs to be burning on our hearts. It is the one thing. It is the one thing that should be the top priority of everything that we do is what I'm doing, increasing my union with Christ. So we're going to have to move from our heads to our hearts. We're going to have to move from our emotions being the dictator of a lot of things that we do. Anybody with me on that? I think it's a very common thing, especially now. The emotions, and what are go emotions are good, love them, um, but they're taking a priority, often even above God's word. What we think, how we feel, is becoming the priority in our culture, and it's something that we're going to have to fight really hard because we're going to hear it everywhere else, and it's going to make us go, yeah, totally, I think that. What about me? And what about this? What about how I feel? Our feelings are not the God, and they don't need to be driving the bus. The Lord needs to be at the center. He needs to be the one that is directing our thoughts, directing our actions, motivating us to go outside of ourselves to reach out to the poor and the lonely and the lost. Our heart is a garden. It truly is. I've been meditating on this for a little while about how it all started in a garden. There's other gardens throughout Scripture and Jesus was crucified right near a garden. He was also betrayed in a garden. And then he rose in a garden. Of course he did. This is so awesome. <laughs> I mean, he's so awesome. And I'm like, and this is the garden. This too is the garden. And what is being planted in here is what's going to bear fruit. So when we look at, like, if our hands are too full of other things and that's what's being planted in the garden, you're going to wonder, oh, that's why this fruit is coming out in my life that might not be one that is good, that might not be one that is ripe and rich and juicy. It, it might be dry or it might be wither. It might just be bad fruit altogether. So we have to look at this, what is being planted in our hearts. And the truth is, is that God is a father who loves us. You've heard this a number of times today. You've heard this a number of times in your life. So we're going to try to move from the head and just knowing it to it, something happening here. And I hope that already was happening this morning. I'm sure it was when Father John was talking. So we're just going to pick back up on that, just, just sort of go back to that place and what the Father was doing in that time because he's still speaking the same message to you and he wants to plan something deep in your heart. It's so, so important that we understand how loved we are. I have three kids and uh, my oldest, Maria, who goes to Franciscan, um, she's 19 now, so not my little baby anymore. I know, I'm so young. How could I possibly have a 19-year-old? I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm the youngest. I don't have a big family, so I didn't have little cousins running around, and I wasn't a babysitter, and I didn't know anything about kids, so I was, like, scared half to death. Like, I wanted a baby so bad, but then I didn't actually dream about it like a lot of people do. Like, I didn't have all the names written down on a list from when I was 12. I wasn't that person. So anyway, I got pregnant with Maria, was so excited. It was actually a miraculous story, but I'll have to tell it another time. And when she was like, when I was like eight months pregnant, I'm starting to freak out because I have an amazing mom. Like she's so, so good. And I was like, how am I going to love this kid? Like the way that my mom loves me. Like I might mess this up. I think I'm going to mess this up. Like, I don't think I have enough to give her. I don't know if I have enough to give her, you know, as a mom. And when she was born, I just looked at her and was like, uh, oh my gosh, and I was flooded with this deep emotion that I was, it caught me so off guard that I was like, what is happening in here? I'm not saying it out loud, but I was like, what is happening in here? And then she was jaundiced and she had to go under the little Billy Rubin lights and she had to put little like gloves on her hands so she didn't scratch away at her eyes because she had to have a blindfold on like this. And, and the guy is setting it up, he's like, yep, so don't let her scratch it off because she'll go blind. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to hold it together <laughs> also nice bedside manner but I was like I'm not the feminine genius at work you know I know you probably would have done a better job delivering that news but anyway I um 
I'm trying to hold it together and I'm not doing a good job and I'm not usually like a super like just ball my face off kind of person. He walked out the door and I was wrecked, like completely wrecked. And all I could do was look at her and go, what are you doing to me? Like, I love you. I don't even know you. <laughs> and I love you so much and I don't even know you. And that experience for me over and over again throughout my life that I have more kids and then other kids. Now I love all the kids. I'm, I'm just like dying to hold this baby over here. Um, I'm totally one of those people, just so you know. Um, and, it's, and it's given me such insight into the love of the Father, this parental love that God has. And I am, I am so broken and I can love like this, this kind of love that's so deep so secure. Like, there's nothing that my kids can do. And let me tell you, they can hurt a mom. They really can. They can wreck your heart in another kind of way. And I can't stop loving them. I wish I could sometimes just put it on hold for a second because it can hurt so bad. And it also can hurt so good. We could break into song, but we won't. Um, <laughs> it hurts so good. It does. And I can't stop loving them. And here I am, just this broken, fragile human being who loves so imperfectly, and yet it's the most magnificent thing that I've ever experienced. And God the Father is not like me. He's so much better than me. And he's better than your mom, who's probably way better than me. And he's better than the dads, and he's better than all of that because he's perfect in every way. So no matter what example we have that is like the most wonderful example of love, and we have saints, and we have all these people that we can look to, it doesn't even come close, not even close. It speaks of it. It alludes to it. It sort of glimmers like it. It reflects it maybe, but like God's love for us is so much greater, so much bigger. And I love this quote from the catechism, number 239. It says, by calling God Father, the language of faith indicates two main things, that God is first the origin of everything and the transcendent authority and that he is at the same time goodness and loving care for all of his children. The language of faith thus draws on, human ex on the human experience of parents who are in a way the first representatives of God for man. Just put a little note there, put a little pin there. Your parents are the first representatives of God for you. That might be good or not good. Just put a pin there, okay? This experience also tells us that human parents are fallible and can disfigure the face of fatherhood and motherhood. And it goes on to say, he also transcends human fatherhood and motherhood, although he is their origin and standard. No one is father like God is father. No one. No one is as good. No one is as kind. No one is as loving. No one is as patient. No one is as faithful, steady, sure, forever and ever. And he's yours. He's your father. He's not just the father. He's your father. Yes, he's our father collectively as a human race, but he is your father. What a privilege I mean, it makes me want to cry. What a privilege that we can say he's mine. He's yours. You have this in your life. The thing that you are most longing for, aching for, desiring is right there. It's right here for me. The thing that I'm just like, I can feel in my heart sometimes a longing so great for something. And I have to face the fact, the truth that like, God is that everything and why, why is he not enough for me? And that comes down to because my hands are too full. I'm actually not able to receive everything because I keep trying to substitute his love, his message, his words, his everything with something else. This is the story we see all throughout the scriptures, is it not? Think about the Old Testament. Just think about it. Think about right at the beginning, Adam and Eve. Hmm, maybe he's holding out on us. Let's try something different. Maybe there's something more. Wow. I'm like, that rings around in my heart all the time. Hmm, this isn't quite working out for me. Lord, you seem kind of distant. Let me take care of it. You know, whatever, whatever the scenario might be. 
oh, this is the constant thing that occurs. And why is that? Because somewhere in me, I doubt that he's going to be enough for me. So in some ways, I don't even let him because I just fill my hands up. I fill my heart up. I fill my mind up with things that aren't him. And, and the goal is for us to just begin to slowly allow him to remove those things from us and for us to surrender those things. But to do that, we have to know what they are, right? At the core of what I want to say today is that God, God is speaking things to you. My husband, Jake, uh, I had two C-sections, and he loved that. I'm sure he did. Um, he loved that because in the first hour, the mom's in recovery, and the dad just gets to hold the baby. It's like super awesome, right? He loved it. He was like, it was just me and them. He's like, and I'm in a room, and they're big eyes. Like, our kids have huge eyes, right? So <laughs> they were like so big with this little head, and he's just holding them, staring at them. And it was then that he began to tell them secrets is what he calls them. And I know for some people that might elicit something negative, but let's just allow God to restore something right now. There's secrets that are good secrets, secrets that only a father can tell. And so Jake would hold their little ear right close to his lips, which I hate it when he does that to me because it tickles, right? <laughs> it's, like, it's like his beard and everything. But anyway, um, he would hold their little ear up to his mouth and he would just say, I love you so much. You are so good. You're so precious to me. I'm never going to leave you. You're mine. I just love you with all my heart. You're amazing. You're going to be so amazing. He would just tell them all these little things, like in the first hour of their life. And it's something that he, he just kept doing, like at night when he would you know, would always pray a little blessing over the kids, and he would just whisper secrets to them. When they were hurt, he would whisper secrets to them. I would whisper secrets to them, too. Different secrets. We had our own secrets. This was important to us. Now, I'm telling you a good story right now, but we can get it wrong a lot. There's a lot of other messages that aren't good that we end up giving our kids that, that we wish we didn't, you know, maybe without knowing that we're doing it. Um, but God has secrets too that he wants to tell you. And Father John was whispering some of those this morning to you. And they're all throughout the scriptures. But do we have ears to hear what God is saying? Not saying here, not saying here, saying here, here, deep in the core. Because our security and our identity of, of knowing that we are a gift deep, deep, deep in our bones is going to set us in a place where we will be unmoved. When you know that God is a father who loves, that he's good, that you don't question that anymore, that the doubts are gone, that you know that you can lean on him because he's going to be there no matter what, and that he's good and that he has good things in store. And in fact, the bad things he can turn into good things because that's just the kind of God that he is. And he can flip everything on its head because that's what he did. He, he died on a cross, which was the most horrible thing, and then flipped it on its head so that now when you look at a cross, you see glory because that's the kind of God that he is. So there's hope in every circumstance. This is what Paul talks about. Like, I'm crushed, but, but like God's love, there's nothing that can separate me from him and him from me. When you're secure in the love of the Father, when you've allowed his secrets to come into the deepest part of your heart, that changes everything. It changes everything. And you might go, cool. <laughs> no. God can change everything. You might go, yeah, and then still think there's going to be all this stuff. No, God can change everything. That tape that goes on in your mind of like all the negative thoughts and the lies and the agreements that you might have made with those, that can change because God is a God of miracles and he can do amazing things if we let him. If we open our hands and open our heart and say, I believe you, God, just come in and change me from the inside and I'm willing to do the work with you and I'm willing to allow myself to be stripped away so that you can come in and heal these places, God can do it. He can. The reason why we struggle so much is because we have an enemy. You know this. It's in the story. We know this. We can talk about it. Yeah, the enemy's at work. Well, he sure is. And I think we actually underestimate. There's always a fear of like, don't over-spiritualize. Okay, but don't under-spiritualize either. We do have an enemy. Is he more powerful than God? 
Absolutely not. That's not even a conversation. It's not even on the table. It's not even a maybe. I used to think that, like most of my life, I believe this lie that the enemy was more powerful than God because that's what I saw. That's what I saw in my life because of my brother and a whole bunch of things that were going on and he was really involved in the occult and the enemy looked big to me, really big, like really, really huge and God looked really small and far away and removed and like he didn't really care. That is a lie. That is not who he is. There's not a battle going on between God and the devil and we're still wondering like who's going to (laughs) win. We know the end of the story. God wins. He won. That's over. They're not still scrapping about it. And like that alone should change everything within us, that God has won a battle that we can't win. He's already won it for us. He's gained everything for us, and we have full access to everything that God has won for us. But if I look at my life, do I see evidence of that? Do I see enough evidence of that? I go, maybe I see some evidence of that, you know? I want to see more evidence of that in my life. And the way that that happens is by letting God come into the places where the enemy has been talking way too much and to bring his truth there. The enemy is also telling you a story. He's whispering secrets, not good ones. He whispers lies. He's the father of lies. John Eldridge says he's called the father of lies, not ridiculous suggestions, or we'd never believe him. He's really good at it. That's why he's the father of lies. He's believable. He will tell you things. It sort of sounds like God is singing this like beautiful melody over your life. And he's singing these words of like love and care. And you heard some of them this morning and blessing. And the enemy is singing a kind of out of tune song. But it sounds kind of like believable, kind of right sometimes. Do you know what I'm saying? Because there's some lies that the enemy has hit me with and I'm like, Man, that's true. I probably shouldn't believe that, but everything in my life says that's true. (laughs) And I could tell you what they are, and I'm sure that you know what your own are. And it might be things like, I'm always a disappointment. People are always going to leave me. I'm not worthy. I'm not lovable. I'm not as good as these people. I don't belong here. I'm going to be nothing. I should be ashamed of myself. These are deep, deep things that the enemy has going on that he's whispering over and over and over and over and over and over again. But the problem is, is that when we listen to that and we don't do anything about it, that voice is going to become so strong and our hands are going to get too full of all the things. Where is the voice of the Father in your life? This is the question that we're putting to you today. Are you listening to the voice of the Father? This needs to be the primary voice that you are seeking out in your life in very practical ways to listen to because the enemy is after you because of your glory. You are glorious. You are made for glory. You are made for great things. Like Imagine what your yes could do, a pure yes from you to the Lord. Your life could have an amazing impact on the world, and I believe it will, to the degree that you are listening to the voice of the Father speak truth into your heart about your identity, that you are a gift, and you are able to offer that gift fully to the world. Watch out, world. So I'm begging you, please. Don't let the enemy's lies be the narrative and the song that you are listening to in your life. My kids like to wear AirPods all the time, you know? It's kind of like that. It's like, will you take those? I totally sound like the boomer, right? I'm like, will you take those things out of your ears? (laughs) They look like lollipop sticks hanging out of your ears. (laughs) Similarly, we have to be able to begin to notice what are the lies that the enemy is saying we got to get really, really clear about it. So this is something that I would like to invite you to take time to do, is to start to write down what are some of the messages that the enemy has been telling me in my life at different stages? What are the ones that feel the most true and why? And this is a conversation that I don't want you going into alone. I want you to have Jesus there. You can have Mary there. If you want any saints you want to bring into that conversation, you do that. Because we are surrounded by a host of heaven that wants to rally us into the truth and into the kingdom living that God has for us here on earth. So what are the lies that the enemy is speaking? 
And then we have to begin to reject the lie and replace it with the truth of God. This is a practical thing. What I'm telling you, I do this like every day in my life. I have scriptures that I've memorized because they have become the main weapon for me in the battle of the mind. You have to arm yourself. The rosary, the Eucharist, the sacraments, confession, healing, all of those, there's so many things. And I like there's other tools, counseling, self-awareness, like all the stuff that we can be growing in, all good, really good. The word of God, his very word is gonna be one powerful weapon in your life and you should use it and you should wield it often. Wield the truth against the lies. You need to become a warrior in this place, in this place in your heart. No more laying down and letting the enemy just say whatever he wants and we're just gonna be at his mercy and be like, okay, There has to be a point where you say no. It's too long that you have been allowing the enemy to speak all of this crap over your life. And it's time to let the truth of God just break through. And it's gonna take some practice and it's gonna take some cooperation with him. So you're gonna have to arm yourself with the scriptures. And and those scriptures really are God's secrets to you. So just as my husband still to this day and we have teenage kids. We'll sometimes whisper secrets to them. It's got to be the right time or it's going to get weird. I know. <laughs> but at the right time, when their heart's tender, when they need to hear the voice of their dad just speaking blessing, when they've experienced rejection, when they've been hurt, when they feel left out, when they've experienced a loss, they need to hear the voice of the one who loves them speak the truth to them about who they are. You know this on a very human level, that there are people that have said things to you in your life or given you certain impressions over and over again that have said something to you that's a lie. That's The enemy is at work and all of that. So we need to replace it with the truth, the Father's secrets. And it happens here and here. These words have to change everything, and they can, because they're not just normal words. They're God's words. God's words have goodness and healing and beauty, and they have power, power to heal, power to change, power to restore, power to set you free. Only his words have the power to set you free. It's not going to be some counselor. My husband's a counselor. Love counselors. But that's not their job. Their job is to accompany, to help, to, you know, like journey along with you. God is the one who heals. God is the one who can use all of these different means to bring healing in your life. But let's not be mistaken. He is the one who heals. He is the one who will set you free. So how do we put ourselves in a disposition to experience that? So I want to give you some scriptures. I'm going to read them to you. I'm going to read them to you. And... um, And you can write them down, but I also want you to simultaneously listen. But before I do that, there's just one other piece that I want to speak about, and that is just about the gaze of God and putting ourselves into the presence of Jesus. Jesus points us to the Father. God is one. You know, we need to have a relationship with each person of the Trinity. Jesus brings us to the Father. He teaches us how to glorify the Father with our lives. He teaches us how to live. His gaze also heals us, just being in his presence. His name also, it says in in the catechism, it's my favorite quote in the catechism, says that the name of Jesus is the only name that contains the presence that it signifies. It's the only name that contains the presence it signifies. So when you say his name, mysteriously, magnificently, he is present. So I don't know about you, but sometimes when I get deep into the lies or deep into the wounds or deep into the things, I don't know what to say. So this is me usually. This is my kitchen counter. This is me on a hard day. Let's go, Lord. Jesus. 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 And I'll just keep at it because he's present in his name. And there's power in his name. This isn't rocket science. Sometimes we think the spiritual life is like, I gotta do, I gotta do, I gotta hustle, I gotta make it happen, I gotta be better, I gotta be holier, I gotta do all the right things, there's a lot of boxes I gotta check, I gotta come up with a plan, I gotta do things. Those are good, those are good, they're really, really good. Those are really good things. 
but they cannot replace the power of Jesus. Just let him be powerful in your life. Let the Father father you in your life. I'm saying this to you. I'm saying it to me too. Like, Heather, let the Father father you. Believe me, I have these conversations with myself all the time. It's awkward if someone's around. Um, So Jesus is real, and we have to come back to the reality of that, like the, the truth of that, that Jesus isn't just a character that lived, you know, a couple thousand years ago, but that he's real. He's a real person right now with a body in heaven. And one day, I hope we're going to kiss that face and hug him because he's real. He's a real person. And he's also yours. He's your savior. He's your brother. He's your Lord. He is the healer, the restorer. He is the only one who can. We're going to break in a song, I swear. <laughs> So here's some scriptures for you to ponder. These are the secrets that God wants to tell you. I specifically chose these ones because I felt like they were really rooted in the theme of identity, about who we are as a gift, about what our calling is. These are things that you should definitely write down, you know, the reference, and then Google it after. And then you should print it out and you should stick it on your bathroom mirror and you should put it on your fridge and you should have it, you know, around because the truths of God need to be louder than the voices of the enemy in your life. We're going to start with Ephesians 2, verse 19. Listen with your heart. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. You are in the household of God. If you're wondering if you belong, you are in the household of God with the saints. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. And once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You are God's people. Isaiah 43, verse 1 to 4. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob. He formed you, O Israel. He's talking about you, just so you know. Fear not, for I have redeemed you and I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. The creator of the entire universe just told you that he loves you. Romans 8, 14 to 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. You get to inherit the kingdom. You're an heir. <sighs> Whew. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. John 15, 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what the master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I've made known to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 to 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Sometimes we hear that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and it's in relation to like all kinds of sexual impurity, but let's just look at it a different way. The Holy Spirit is living in you. You are never, ever, ever, ever alone. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is living in you. You think you're weak? You think you can't? You can't. But he can. 
and he's living inside of you. Jeremiah 1, verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you, and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. John 15, 16. I'm racing through these, but you're going to sit with them in your prayer time, right? You did not choose me. I chose you, and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit shall abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. 1 John 3, chapter 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. That is what we are. So my invitation to you as I just wrap up here is to take these scriptures just as some. If you need other scriptures about hope, about peace, Google it. Just say scriptures about hope. It's, it's not hard. They'll all come up for you. Somebody's already done the work. It's awesome. I love it when people do that for me. And then, and then you just take the ones that God is speaking. You hold up the lie against the truth because God doesn't lie. And then you hold that truth and you stick it up against the lie as often as you need to until one starts to dissipate and the truth will reign there. You are children of God, of a Father who loves you so deeply. And when you know that here, deep in your bones, you will be able to make a gift of yourself to the world that is going to transform the world. We believe in you. We believe in you. May God bless you. And so here's the thing. There's three words that I want you to carry with you as we go through this this morning. Reality, root, and response. Reality, root, and response. And so for reality, the way that you can respond with only the gifts that you've been given is for you to accept the reality that you have been given. Accept the reality that you have been given. You can even write it down as reality as given to me. Let me ask you something. If a farmer is going out to plant a seed, does the farmer choose to plant the seed where that seed would grow well, or does he choose to plant the seed in the place that he desires it to be? He desires to plant it somewhere where it would grow, grow well. And so we have to accept the reality that's been given. Because the truth is, is that if you don't accept the reality that is given, you can no longer act in truth and you cannot act in freedom. You have to make sure that you're aware of the reality. We always want to posit false realities, right? Sure, I can do this. Someone asked me the other day, Rachel, how do you have six kids and you've got two books coming out? And I'm thinking to myself, because I wrote those a long time ago. I mean, I'm not writing books right now. Because my reality doesn't match that desire. You have to make sure that the Lord is calling you. He's never going to call you out of something that doesn't match a reality, right? St. Ignatius of Loyola, we've been talking this week a lot about his discernment of spirits. And if you read about his story, after his injury, when he was healing, right, he was laying in the bed, and he started to discern. And one of the things that he said, he's like, well, I have to decide, am I going to go and pursue this woman. Now, remember, this woman that he was speaking of was kind of like a celebrity of their time. He had never met her. The chances of him meeting her were very slim. But he sat there and he thought, well, I can say this because my husband looks like Keanu Reeves, okay? Like, wait a minute, not John Wick Keanu Reeves. I don't know how old you guys are, but speed Keanu Reeves, like that Keanu Reeves, matrix Keanu Reeves. So anyway, so what if I, if I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, Lord, Am I called to marry Keanu Reeves? <laughs> or am I called to surrender my life to you? Right? And the truth is, is that St. Ignatius would sit there with those two realities, and he would look at the patterns of his heart. And then he would also think to himself, what is actually possible right now? What is actually possible right now? What is the reality that I have been given? Another enemy of that reality is comparison. 
All right, raise your hand if you've ever compared yourself to someone else. If your hand is down, we'll talk, okay, outside, because you're very holy. Uh, so if you've ever compared yourself to someone else, I think one of the greatest and worst tools of that is social media, right? And so I really want to invite you today in your time of prayer, maybe you go and sit before the Blessed Sacrament or you take a few minutes out here in the courtyard. I want you to get out whatever feed you frequent. And I want you to look at the first few accounts that come up, and I want you to ask yourself, does this person lead me to Christ? When I read the things that they post or I look at the things that they post, do I walk away from this feeling closer to God? Am I more at peace? Because if you're not, unfollow them. Unfollow them. Delete the app. I mean, I say that like it's such a simple thing, but man, we like to hold on, right? And I really think that sometimes if we would gain the courage to let God have it, that he will get it and our claw marks are on it, right? Because we've been trying to hold on for so long. Let it go, ladies. Let it go. You have got to have the courage to make sure that the things that you're taking in are the things that are leading you to Christ. The other thing that you can do to make sure that you're not falling prey to this enemy of comparison and, and this thought of like feeling envy towards other people or desiring something else, like looking at someone and going, man, I really wish I could wear something like that. I wish I had her talent. I wish that my action plan looked like that. Number one, you can take that to the heart of Christ. St. Therese of Lisieux would take the good and the bad and sit before Christ and say, what is in this for me? Because there is always something in it for you. The other thing that you can do, a direct approach, right? We learned from Regina the other day about these direct approach, is you go up to that person and say, man, I love your outfit. Man, I love the way that your action plan looks. You talked about rest. I want you to teach me about rest. You take the thing that intimidates you and you allow it to teach you. Allow those things to become tools for your formation. And then the other thing that you hear in this discernment of spirits is awareness, right? To grow in awareness. Actually, last night we sat before the Blessed Sacrament and we all sang that, didn't we? May I become, let us become more aware of your presence. Now, I know that there might be a thought, man, Rachel, I'm pretty aware of the presence of God. I mean, I make sure that I thank him for the rising of the sun and I thank him for all of my sisters here. I'm really aware of the presence of God. Hard truth, if you're aware of the presence of God to the maximum amount that you should be, you would no longer sin. Awareness of the presence of God will lead you to a place where everything that you do as an embodied person affects your soul. Your clicks matter because your finger extends that click out into the world. What you hear, what you say, what you see, what you do, everything matters. So let us grow in the awareness of the presence of God because that will make the reality the reality that is meant for you. The only reality that you should reside in is a reality that you are a beloved daughter of God. Act like someone who is loved because you are. And so that next thing, root, root. So one of the things that I studied in order to get ready for this talk is, is an arborist blog, okay? I'm a giant nerd. I looked up, I was like, how do I tell them what an arborist is? And Wikipedia was like, it's a tree surgeon. So an arborist blog, a tree surgeon. And this guy was studying this tree and the tree was really beautiful. Had beautiful limbs, had beautiful leaves. It provided a lot of shade. Everything around it was healthy. And what they did is they took air, and there's a study that allows you to pump air into the ground in such a way that it then reveals the root network 
of the tree. And see, he looked at the root network of the tree, and there was a root that was growing in such a way that it was starting to encircle all the other roots. And it was beginning to constrict. And in the blog, he wrote with astonishment, it's crazy that this one root was about to kill the entire tree. That if we kept letting it grow that way, that eventually the entire tree would die. And so that's one of the temptations of our time, is to make sure that everything here on the surface looks real pretty, right? That we're doing good ministry and our clothes are always put together and that we always have perfect makeup and perfect hair and we're doing all the things, but inside there's a root that is constricting the love of Christ. And so just like that air that's pumped into the ground, may you let the air of the Holy Spirit breathe over you and let him reveal the network of the root that you're allowing to be in your heart. Now that word root comes from the Latin word radix, which means radical. In order for you to get to the root of whatever that wound is, it requires a radical act. It requires you to radically pay attention to the root, do the work to uproot it. One of my kids the other day, he asked me, why, why isn't everyone like our family, Mom? Our family's a little weird. <laughs> We're a little weird. And I was honest with him because he's getting into these preteen years so I can be real honest with him. And I said, Gabriel, because this is hard, buddy. Not everyone does this because this is hard. Doing the work of being a healed and whole person is not a walk in the park. The work that has begun this week is something that you have to carry for the rest of your lives. That's something that I respect about this Given Institute Forum is because we are giving you the tools to not just leave it here at Newman, but to then take it home, allow it to continue, and then allow it to then make the world more beautiful. You have to do the work. And so I want you to look at the work that you're doing and, and look at these, especially look at these roots. Let me, let me go back to looking at these roots. We've talked about this quote, in my deepest wound, I saw your glory, right? And it dazzled me. Ladies, this week you've seen like what your gifts are. You talked about the things that are keeping your hands full. And I promise you that if you show the Lord your greatest vice, that he will show you your greatest virtue. Show the Lord your greatest vice, and he will show you your greatest virtue. And so then we come to this last R, this response. Agere sequitor esse. That means action flows from being. Action flows from being. You have to learn to be before you can become. You have to learn to be before you can do. Where does your being reside? When Jason and I were first starting to date, there was this time that somehow we were on a swing. I don't know where we were while we were on a swing, but it's very vivid in my memory that we're sitting on this swing. And I realized after a few minutes that, oh my gosh, like we're not talking. This is weird. Why aren't we talking? And I very much heard the Holy Spirit say, because there's nothing left to say. Like you don't have to impress him anymore. He doesn't need to impress you anymore. You can just be on this swing. And so I hope that that's where you're led this week, that you can sit before Christ and not have to spout off all of your desires, all of your equivocation for your existence. We do that, right? We try to, to make reason for our existence. I'm here because, and let me tell you something, God is like, I'm just happy you're here. Don't feel like 
you have to make an excuse for the fact that you exist, ladies. I am just happy that you are here. And if you can be happy with the fact that you exist, the fact that you are a being called to become, then those actions will then be rooted in the reality that you are a beloved daughter of God. Don't let them be rooted in something else because it doesn't work. I've tried that. You probably have too, right? And it doesn't work. So I want you to ask yourself in everything that you do, let it become a prayer. How is what I'm doing allowing me to become who you want me to be? How is what I'm doing allowing me to become who you want me to be? So St. Alphonsus Liguori, who is the patron saint of confessors and moral theologians, he said, it is not enough to do good works. They need to be done well. For our works to be good and perfect, they must be done for the sole purpose of pleasing God. So good and perfect, that's not according to the perfection of the world. That doesn't mean that there's some grading scale or some task list that needs to be checked for you to know that it's perfect. Instead, your prayer is not for perfection. Your prayer should be for a purity of intention. A purity of intention. And if your intention is always to glorify the Father, it will make everything easier. It will make conflict resolution easier. It will make putting your action plan easier. It will make everything that you do engulfed in grace. And if it's engulfed in grace and you realize that reality as love love daughter of God, then your nature can then be built upon by the grace of God. Grace builds on nature. That's why when the Lord gives you something that then fits into your reality, you will look at it later and go, how did I do that? And the Lord will say, because you let me help you. And so the truth is, ladies, that above all, your identity, no matter what your vocation is, whether you sit here as a consecrated religious, whether you sit here as a married woman or as a single woman seeking out that vocation, all of our vocations are the same. Ratzinger calls this the anthropological pattern of the human person. And that is that you are called to be daughter to be spouse, and to be parent. Everything that you do falls within those realities of who we are as persons. I see it in my kids. I see my sons learning what it's like to be spouse. I see my daughters learning what it's like to be mother. And they have no idea what lies ahead for them. And you see all of those realities for each of us. But the only thing that allows you to be a good spouse, that allows you to be a good mother, that allows you to then extend your soul as the shelter that other, play, other souls can then find shelter, right? The only thing that allows you to do that is if you always remember to be a good daughter first. Last night I was sitting there and I was watching our beloved priests presiding over adoration. And I thought to myself, they're such good fathers, right? And the Lord was like, they're really good sons. And so that's the truth for you. Anytime that you find it difficult in life, like maybe work is tough, maybe your family relationships are tough, Maybe trying to put this given action plan into motion becomes tough. I want you to ask yourself, am I remembering that I am a daughter? Have I forgotten who I am? Blessed Carlo Acuti said, every minute that passes in vain is a missed opportunity to become more holy. 
Every minute that passes in vain is a missed opportunity to become more holy. And any time that we decide to live our lives fully, it's because of two things. It's because you've seen someone live their life well or death has come. Don't let it be those two things. You can do that now. You can sit here today and say, I don't have time. Right? There's all those memes that fly around, right? Not today. And I want you to look at the enemy today. Look at all the lies. Look at all the distractions and say, not today. I don't have time. You don't have time for foolish issues. You know, you know what you have time for? You have time to be loved. And so daughters of God, let me leave you with this final word. May you not be remembered for the gifts that you have. May you not be remembered for the talents. May you not be remembered for the things that the world tells you are where glory is found. But when people remember you, when someone leaves from your presence after this forum is over with, may they say, I knew her. She is loved by God. God bless you.